Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. A museum of natural history has little need to expand its space. There'll be no new dinosaurs, nor does a museum of antiquities. Its objects are frozen in time. But a museum of modern art is forever beset with new objects by new generations of artists worthy of inclusion in its exhibitions. Founded in 1929, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, known as MoMA, has risen to the challenge with an amazing reboot, adding 47,000 square feet to its exhibition galleries and rehanging its extraordinary collection, arranged in accordance with themes and forms, transcending media as well as chronology to arrest the viewer's interest as never before. The rehang fetched raised eyebrows from some critics, followed by rave reviews from those that mattered. New York Magazine's art critic Jerry Saltz idyllically likened the new MoMA to the Garden of Eden. Here to tell us about the new postmodern MoMA is its legendary director, Glenn Lowry, who will celebrate this year his 25th anniversary at the helm of the museum. We're delighted to have Glenn Lowry with us. Thank you, Jim. Well, now, uh, 25 years ago, you were a specialist in Islamic art. You wrote a PhD thesis in Islamic art. Did you find the transition to modern art uh, challenging? Well, <laughs> I love art. So, you know, the, I got interested in art history through Islamic art, and I was lucky enough to have also been able to study beyond that. And of course, over the years, you acquire a great deal of information as you drive into a subject. So while Islamic art gave me a grounding in medieval Persian painting and 16th century Mughal architecture, it also gave me a way of thinking about the world that enlarged my own perspective about how and where art is made. So I think it was a good grounding in understanding that modern art is just part of a larger conversation that needs to be understood understood both in terms of its past, but also in terms of its future. Okay, so looking at the future, and MoMA seems has been constantly on the build in 1983. Before you got there, it doubled its size uh, in the period of, I guess, 1997 to uh, 2004. Uh, you did the, the marvelous building, which was designed by the Japanese architect Yoshio uh, Taniguchi. Uh uh, and uh, then now the, uh, and that increased your size by about 25%. And now you have the recent expansion uh, where it's 30%. And why do you need all this space? Well, there are a number of reasons why we need so much <laughs> space. Uh, part of it is that we were under spaced before. We were really an institution cramped by the confines of our footprint. But beyond that, we needed different kinds of space in order to realize new curatorial ambitions. And the way I look at this is that the Museum of Modern Art has always been reconsidering the hardware and the software of what it does. So the hardware is its physical uh, environment, and the software are the ideas that power the way in which the collection is displayed and interpreted. So with a new generation of chief curators, none of whom were there in 2004, and with a whole new set of ideas, it was very clear that we needed not only more space, but different kinds of space that allowed for a more expansive and nuanced interpretation of the collection. So we added about 30% more space, but most of that space was geared towards the reconfiguration of our own collection as opposed to expanding the galleries for temporary exhibitions. And that was because there were so many new ideas and so many new works of art to our collection since 2004 that we felt it was essential to give those voice through this project. Well, tell us about some of the new ideas uh, because uh, the, uh, the new MoMA is really something that's quite dynamic in its presentation of of art from different periods and, and art in different media. So there were three big ideas that guided the architecture of the project, which was to provide more space to show art with new kinds of galleries, and I'll talk about those in a moment, but to also create a more generous and welcoming experience as you entered the museum by reconfiguring our ground floor and in fact making it free to the public. And finally, to connect the building better to the city through more windows, through more uh, vistas that allow people from the outside to see in, but people from the inside to see out. And that was achieved largely by reorienting our ground floor, by 
producing a brand new stair on the west side of the building that literally floats in space but opens up to 53rd and 52nd Street, but also allows people passing by to see in. And then most importantly, by creating new galleries like our studio for performance, uh, our first custom built space for this very important aspect of contemporary practice, that is the making of art by live people. Beyond that, what we wanted to do was to take the different parts of our collection that had been, in a way, atomized into their own cellular location. So photography was disengaged from prints and drawings, which was disengaged from architecture and design, which was disengaged from painting and sculpture. We had become, in a way, separate institutions under one roof. And we wanted to bring them back together because the founding vision of the Museum of Modern Art was that all of these different ideas existed together. They weren't separated from each other. So the new museum puts architecture and design, photography, prints, drawings, back together with painting and sculpture in a much more synthetic whole. So you had silos. Uh, the various departments were separate, and that was the old uh, MoMA approach. And you brought them together. Was that difficult? Were there turf wars? Was uh, everyone very willing to work together, or was that challenging? I mean, did you just pound the table and say, you've got to do it? Well, I certainly didn't pound the table because I think there was a general desire to figure out how to do it. But, you know, when you have 30 or 40 years of history, because that's how the museum had operated since the 1980s, it takes a while to unpack that because it wasn't that the departments were. Uh, not producing great work, they were. It's that they needed to learn how to work together across disciplines and across um, the divisions that had been put in place over time. And so that took a decade or more of discussion, of testing ideas out, of recognizing that everybody had to learn to trust each other, that there was expertise in those departments that needed to be shared across departments, but there were also ideas that had to be absolutely embraced by everybody. And so it was a gradual process. We didn't do it overnight. From my perspective, we really started in 2000 when we did a series of exhibitions to celebrate the new millennium that were interdisciplinary and that were very complicated to do and that you know were roundly critiqued by many and celebrated by others, but they were the beginning of a process of learning to work together. And we continued that over the next 20 years with different experiments that allowed each department to learn how to work with all the other departments. I think we've arrived at a place now where nobody can imagine going back to a kind of cellular structure for the institution. Well, traditionally you had kind of a linear presentation, isn't that right? You had a, a paintings room, a sculpture room, a, a room upon room, a, a photography room, an architecture room and somehow or other you mixed and matched now uh, and juxtaposed. Not entirely, but for the most part, I think that's a fair statement. What was the idea behind that? Well, I think one has to understand that over time, we're talking 20, 30, 40 years, the museum had become what I think of as a vectored space. It had a beginning, middle, and end. And you kind of entered this trajectory and it told you the story of modern and contemporary art as if it were a already determined story in which there was no latitude for competing ideas to um, intersect with each other, where there was no uh, uncertainty about what was going to be ultimately important. And, and I think that was premature to try and do that, as if the present were as clearly understood as the distant past. So we needed to, in a way, become a rhizome, become something that had uh, roots going out in multiple directions. Uh, and so the new building is all about this kind of rhizomic presentation of the collection. If you think about it. What do you mean it, by rhizomic? So a rhizome is an underground root that lets out lateral tentacles. So what, even though the root is moving forward, it's always letting out these lateral tentacles to, in a sense, ground itself. And so we tried to develop a presentation that was broadly chronological, so it does follow a rough structure of the most recent to the most distant past within our collection, the second floor being the most recent work, the fifth floor being the most distant, or if you start at the top, the, the earliest work going down to the most recent. But rather than tell that story in a sequence of predetermined 
galleries, each one leading to the other. We've laid out the collection in a very broad way. Each gallery is its own separate story and it can be um, taken out and replaced by another story and there's no sense of linearity as if one thing begat another thing. So that this notion that at any one moment in time there are competing ideas, competing issues uh, and that for instance the, the story that the Museum of Modern Art told of the triumph of abstraction uh, was a very narrow story. There were of course artists who never gave up figuration and other artists for whom figuration was central to rediscovering the way in which they wanted to work. So those ideas and those stories are brought back together again and I think it makes for a richer, more nuanced and ultimately more satisfying experience of the museum. Well, uh, let's take it for instance. Uh, on the fifth floor, uh, you have your iconic uh, painting, the cornerstone perhaps of your collection, uh, Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon. Uh, it uh, was supposed to be the foundation of Cubism. He's portraying Catalan prostitutes. Uh, it was uh, painted in 1907. Uh, and then in the same room, you have two artists who weren't even born in 1907. Uh, you have uh, the uh, Faith Rheingold, uh, American Story, which portrays, uh, which certainly ha portrays African American women and portrays violence. And uh, you have Louise Bourgeois uh, uh, portraying a female power, and uh, uh, particularly in the context of weaving, I guess, and uh, or there are other interpretations. But how do you uh, justify the uh, intimate relationship of three objects such as those? Well, that's perhaps one of the most interesting new juxtapositions in the museum, and I think it speaks to the fact that historically Picasso is seen primarily through the formalist lens of Cubism. But that painting is actually also about violence, it's about the impact of Africa and particularly African art, and it's about the role of women as seen through the gaze of a male artist. So we thought that bringing in female voices and recognizing that for that painting to stay meaningful it has to speak across time. So Faith Ringgold is an artist who in the 60s came to the Museum of Modern Art frequently, studied Picasso, especially Guernica, but also the Demoiselle d'Avignon. And her painting is also about a different kind of violence, but it is a powerful violence that speaks back to the impact of Africa and African art, but also the impact of race and discrimination. And in a way it is a counterpoint to the Demoiselle d'Avignon, powerfully evoking some of the same themes seen through a different lens. And what I think really comes through in that juxtaposition is that Picasso continues to speak to us across time. And in a way, Faith Ringgold animates Picasso, gives that painting a newfound energy because it takes it out of the narrow lens of Cubism and brings it into a much broader lens around violence, the female form, the impact of Africa. And in the same way, Louise Bourgeois speaks to a very feminist perspective around male power. Uh, which, of course, is also embedded in the Demoiselle d'Avignon. And I think if we're successful, these juxtapositions enable people to understand these works of art not as historical artifacts, something from 1907, but as a work of art that is still powerful and meaningful today. But you really make the uh, museum goer in that room and in other rooms uh, think about something other than the art itself because you're raising issues that are challenging and... Uh, that uh, perhaps people didn't think about. Well, I think that's what art always does to raise issues and make you think. There are many aspects to looking at art, one of which is the pure pleasure of seeing something beautiful or interesting. But great works of art spark the imagination. They take you on flights of fancy. They cause you to think hard about critical issues. And I hope that throughout the museum, uh, we've calibrated the installation so that it does provide the pleasure of looking at and discovering works of art you might not have been familiar with or old works of art that you know you will enjoy, but at the same time putting them in a context that makes them feel alive and new and of the moment. And I think that's really critical because the Museum of Modern Art was predicated on the idea that it was about the art of our time. So even the most uh, historical works in our collection, works that go back almost 130 years, are meaningful because they speak to the present. That's why they're there. 
Well, you doubtless saw the op-ed that the president of the Ford Foundation, Darren Walker, wrote in the New York Times where he was critical of museums. He said uh, museums are supposed to be the guardians of a fading social and demographic order. They have a responsibility to hold a mirror up to society and uh, that they must represent a broader cross-section of America. Uh, and you've adverted uh, to uh, multiculturalism and uh, issues of, of gender and race, uh, and these themes resonate uh, throughout the museum, particularly the uh, additional presence of uh, female artists. Uh, do you agree with Walker? And uh, my first question, and secondly, do you think you've carried out what, uh, sufficiently what he's suggesting? Well, first of all, I think museums, especially museums of modern art, are works in progress. We are not finished. We're not fully baked. We're always in transformation, thinking and rethinking both what we do and how we do it. And I You're think, not thinking of another expansion art. <laughs> certainly not me, uh, but no doubt there will be one at some point in the future. But much more importantly, intellectually, we're works in progress. We grapple with the critical issues of our time. And as those issues change, we change as well. So Darren, I think, was responding largely to a current wave of activism that looks not only at what is represented in the museum, the works of art, who made them, where they come from, but also who represents the institution, the curators, the professional staff, the boards of trustees, and the degree to which those who represent the institution reflect those that are on display in the museum. And, and there's always going to be some um, disjuncture between the two. And I think Darren spoke eloquently to the need for boards, but I take it beyond boards, museums in general, to make sure that they are embracing the complex social dynamic in which we live, and not to be afraid of it, that ideas come from many different places. And I think there's a great deal of literature that says the more diverse one's staff, the more diverse one's board, the more likely there are going to be good competing ideas to work with. And I think he was speaking to the need for institutions not to feel threatened by the current wave of activism, but to take it seriously and ask themselves how they can respond intelligently. That's how I read it. Uh, the New York Times critic uh, said that MoMA had a white male and nationalist past, which is now getting past, really, with the, the type of presentation you make with the, the new museum. Uh, do you agree with that? Was there a, a period of time in MoMA's history where it was circumscribed uh, by traditionalist views? Well, I think the Museum of Modern Art has been many different things over the years. That's why I think of it as a work in progress. When we were founded in 1929 and through the 30s and into the 40s in our early years, we were wildly experimental. We looked at art from all over the world. We uh, did exhibitions of uh, indigenous art. We did exhibitions of art from South a Asia. We did exhibitions that pushed the envelope of what art actually was. And we collected broadly. We began collecting Latin American art literally in the 1930s and have continued to do so. We looked at what was going on uh, in Asia. We looked at what was going on in Africa, not always collecting the material, but at least being interested in it. And it's not surprising to me that in the 1960s we were making critical acquisitions of contemporary art by terrific Indian artists like Vasudeo Gaitunde or by uh, Iranian artists like Charles uh, Zenderudi. So it isn't that we were blind to what was going on, but I think in the 80s and 90s, we became an ever more narrowly focused institution on what has been described as a largely Eurocentric and North American perspective. And there was some truth to that, even though the reality was always more nuanced and complex. And in the process of doing that, we did not pay as much attention as we should have or could have to other voices, the voice of women, the voice of African Americans, the voice of artists working outside this Eurocentric tradition. So the last decades of the museum's um, work have been about adjusting our perspective to embrace a more global perspective, recognizing that uh, our history is long uh, and that we don't need to be circumscribed only by decisions that were made in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. We can imagine a museum that is more fulsome 
is more international in perspective and that addresses the critical issues of our time. And those issues do involve gender, race, identity, and that is seen across uh, geographies. Well, you mentioned um, uh, Indian art and the focus on Indian art in the old days, and I think you mentioned two male Indian artists. Uh, but now in the, uh, in the exhibition, you have the work of two female Indian artists, uh, the work of uh, Merlini uh, Mukherjee, uh, and uh, the work of, uh, uh, there's another work by Sheila. Sheila Gowda. Gowda, yeah. Now, uh, and Dianita Singh. Dianita Singh. So uh, uh, is there a new emphasis on women uh, artists at moment? There is certainly a newfound commitment to ensuring that we take the work of women as seriously as we take the work of men, and that has meant many important works of art entering our collection by women, uh, and that in our effort to look carefully at where great art is being made, places like uh, India are points of focus. And it's not a surprise to me that the Mukherjee, which is an extraordinary work of art, entered the collection along with Dianita Singh's Museum of Chants, her masterwork, along with one of Sheila Gowda's great installations. These are critically important works. And what, what I think is so interesting is they feel at home. They don't feel as if they were add-ons or uh, forced uh, juxtapositions. They feel utterly engaged and at home with the other works of art around them. They amplify the meaning of those works of art by giving them a richer and broader context in which to be seen. You had roughly three million visitors to the museum last year. Uh, do you have any sense that this new approach, this multicultural approach makes the museum more marketable, that it's going to attract even more people, young people, uh, to the museum who are interested in, in these areas? Well, this project wasn't generated by the desire to grow our attendance, which of course we would love to do, but it wasn't about uh, growing our attendance. It was really about addressing a whole range of critical intellectual issues that we felt were essential if we wanted to remain a museum of modern and contemporary art. And I'm hopeful that our audience will continue in the three million range or larger. Uh, but I don't want to pin this only on whether or not we can grow our audience. Growing audience is important, and I think it's something we all take seriously at MoMA and at other institutions. We want as many people as possible to see and engage in and enjoy the art that we have on display. But even more important, from my perspective, is that we can develop a rich community of people who see the museum as their intellectual, even emotional home. And if that audience, uh, which tends to reflect itself in membership even more than daily attendance, uh, continues to grow robustly, we have over 130,000 members today, then I'll feel really satisfied. Uh, it's not all mix and match at the moment of day. You do have a Brancusi room. Uh, you have, a, I think, a special exhibition coming up of Donald Judd. You have a special exhibition of uh, photography by uh, Dorothea Lange. Uh, so uh, you're not completely divorced from, the, uh, from past approaches, are you? No, I think the way I see this project, it's a bit of both and. Both are traditional ability to go in depth with individual artists and our ability to cut across media in order to create a richer and fuller experience. So there are many rooms in the museum devoted to individual artists, whether it's Brancusi or uh, Monet and the Water Lilies or Matisse, uh, now with the Dorothea Lange exhibition, but before that we had an exquisite Betty Saar exhibition. Donald Judd is a temporary exhibition that grows out of our collection but includes a vast number of loans from elsewhere. We're not a, going to walk away from our commitment to individual artists seen in a rich and in-depth context. But I think what's equally important to us is to always ensure that the experience of the collection is one that sparks the imagination by bringing works of art and ideas across departments in a way, together in a way that, that really is impactful. So I have a question for you, Glenn Lowry, in conclusion. Uh, you've talked about juxtaposition. You've talked about multiculturalism. Uh, you've talked about departments 
working together, breaking down the walls and the silos. Uh, you've talked about a novel approach uh, uh, across time uh, in the presentation of art. Uh, has MoMA uh, reinvented itself? Well, I hope MoMA is in the process of reinventing itself. I think it's an ongoing process. It's a work in progress. I really feel that what makes a great institution like ours remain modern is that it's never the same, uh, that it recognizes its commitment to understanding the art of our time in all of its complex facets, but also to evolving, to changing, to embracing new ideas, to reimagining the way it presents itself, but also n to recognize that there's a certain self-criticality that is essential to any intelligent institution. So have we reinvented ourselves? No. But are we reinventing ourselves? Yes. Self-criticality. Glenn Lowry, thank you so thank much you, for Jim. coming by. This has been just marvelous. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best. Thank you.